Welcome to My Hometown, the program that explores clubs, organizations, businesses, and issues across Nassau and Suffolk counties and sheds light on the different towns that are making a difference. Hello and welcome to My Hometown. I'm Bill Horan, along with my co-host, Nassau Community College student, Corey Kaufman, coming to you live once again via Zoom and being socially distant as recommended. And Corey, today we're going to learn about another fabulous organization. And we've spoken about them before on our show, so it's time for an update. That's right, Bill. EAC Network's mission is to empower, assist, and care for people in need across Long Island and New York City. Let's learn more by saying hello to our guest, Tania Peterson Chandler, the Vice President of Operations and Interim President and CEO of EAC. Tania, welcome to my hometown on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. Hello, thank you for having me. Tania, first of all, how are you making it through these difficult times of the pandemic personally? <laughs> um, well, you know, managing every day is something different and, um, you know, dealing with both organizational stuff and stuff at home. I have a 14-year-old, so every day he has additional questions and, you know, but we're managing. Thankfully, everyone is healthy. And staying well, so yeah. staying away from the germs and that pesky little virus. Okay, yeah. that's, that's good to hear. So tell us, what is EAC Network and how your mission makes a difference here on Long Island? Well, EAC Network is a 51-year-old not-for-profit agency with over 100 different programs. Um, and we provide services in five main areas. Um, children and youth services, which includes programs like our Alternatives for Youth, Um, where we work with at-risk youth, foster children, um, and victims of human trafficking. We have programs in the area of family and community services, which includes our mediation services, assisting uh, people with managing their child support payments, supervised visitation, parenting education, um, home energy assistance, We have um, our largest uh, core of programs is with the Behavioral Health and Criminal Justice Unit. Um, And there we have a outpatient substance abuse clinic in Nassau. And then throughout Long Island and New York City, we have alternative to incarceration, alternative to detention, reentry case management programs, working with people in the criminal justice system who have substance abuse and or mental health issues and need assistance uh, re integrating into the community. We have um, senior and nutrition services programs, which um, we are the largest provider for Meals on Wheels in Nassau. We have guardianship programs in Nassau and Suffolk. We have a number of senior community centers, um, nutrition services for those who have um, HIV. And then we have vocational service programs, which um, help people preparing to enter um, the job market and also helping them get jobs and maintaining those jobs for both um, adolescents and adults. So with all of those areas, we have over 100 different programs, about 500 staff, um, and we are in Long Island, throughout Long Island and New York City, and we have a program in Rockland County as well. Wow. Wearing a lot of hats. Yes. (laughs) Tania, it sounds like you could run Amazon and it would be easier for you, a shorter (laughs) day. <laughs> well, I've been with the agency for over 20 years, so this is, you know, this is what I know. This comes second nature to me. No, it, I'm sure it really does, but I'm listening to that, and all I could picture was like a new series in the fall coming on that, uh, because you're involved with all the things. What do we look at? Medical, uh, uh, police, detectives. It seems that you're in the courts. Th- those are all the main series wrapped up in what you're doing. So uh, you, you must put in a very, very long day. <laughs> <laughs> It's never ending. But I mean, we want to make sure that we serve, you know, the whole population. So even if we get, you know, a client that comes in and in one aspect of a program that we have, we have ability to refer them to other services. So, I mean, that's what what I love about what we do. And that's great because if someone wants some help, it doesn't help them just to say, no, I'm sorry, we're not the organization. If you can refer them or at least give them some direction, that that's always the help that people are looking for. Exactly. Now, what... What parts of Long Island does your agency actually serve? We're all in all across Long Island, Nassau and Suffolk, and we have programs all over. And you have programs from children through seniors. So can you tell us some about the specifics of those programs? And we'll start with the youngest and go to the oldest. <laughs> right. So we have our Alternatives for Youth program works with um, children who are um, 
persons in needs of supervision. So parents are having difficulty working with their children and they're involved in the family court system or involved with probation. We have case managers that will work intensely with the clients and with their family. Um, we have both home-based and community-based services that um, we have a team that will work with the family and with the child to make sure that um, the child is receiving all the services that they need and that, if possible, that they can remain within the home. Um, and they'll get vocational services, um, family communication services, parenting education. Um, and so it is really just trying to keep the, the family together. We have um, our Safe Harbor program, which has two components, but that works with um, victims of human trafficking. Um, and so it's, there's a peer mentoring piece to it, and then also just really connecting to services. We have our Child Advocacy Center, which is in Central Islip, and we have a satellite site in Riverhead, which is um, one of our pinnacle uh, programs where um, children who are abused and have to go through the system and have to be interviewed by the police and by child services and you know social workers instead of them having to repeat their story several times they come to our child advocacy center we have uh, medical staff there who can do the um, physical exams and then the police and whoever else can do their um video exams um, and interviewing of the child at the child advocacy center so they essentially only have to tell their story one time as opposed to several different adults and we have staff there that you know work with the child and the family th that are going through um, the the system and dealing with the abuse um, we also um, in the children aspects of things we <clears throat> have uh, mentoring programs for uh, foster care children as well. And unfortunately this summer we didn't do it, but um, usually in the summer we have um, camps for foster children, you know, as well. That's some arrangement that you have there. And where physically are you located? So our administrative office is in Hempstead. But we have offices in Hempstead, Central Islip. As far as the children's programs there um, in Hop Hog and in Hempstead. But as far as all of our programs, we're all across Long Island, even as far as, uh, like I was saying, we have the Riverhead um, Child Advocacy Center, and we do work in the jails in Riverhead as well. And by the way, dealing with the younger people, if someone needs any of those services, do they come to you directly, or do they, do they have to be referred by, for instance, the DA, the police, uh, a legal organization? Right. So it normally they have to be referred. So it depends because there's so many different uh, programs. We have a number of different referral sources. But if someone did call up and need services, we would be able to connect them based on what you know they needed or could connect them to where uh, they have to get referred from. But a lot of them are either referred from probation, from the court, um, from the police department when it is uh, dealing with the abuse kids um, or from the foster care system. So a lot of it is from referrals from, from different entities. We have a strong partnership with the Department of Social Services. Um, but again, if someone called up and had questions or needed, you know, assistance, we would be able to connect them um, either directly or have them, you know, give them the information to the referral entity that they needed. And Tania, what about the older people, the senior members of our society? Right. So that that's, I don't have any favorites, right? But <laughs> But I can say that I do have an affinity for our senior programs. They are a, a, a group that really does grow on you. And um, they, we have a number of senior centers. We have in Hempstead, in North Merrick, in Long Beach. Um, and we have uh, the Meals on Wheels program, which I said, as well. We're the largest provider for Meals on Wheels in Nassau. And then we have a, um, a intensive case management program for the seniors as well. And that is one of the programs that during this pandemic has been going nonstop. Um, you know, a lot of, of the things that we've been doing has had to been done remotely. Um, but as far as our senior programs, we had to adjust to figure out how to continue to get the seniors their meals. Um, we had to stop the on-site operations at the senior centers because of the social distancing, but we were figuring out ways to make sure that they stayed engaged, make sure that they stayed healthy, make sure that they stayed active and did that virtually. Um, and that included, you know, making sure that they had cooking demonstrations and exercise classes and knitting and yarning and those kind of, you know, using yarn and the things that they would get if they came to the senior center. Um, we were figuring out how to do that virtually. And we use, um, you know, our staff and, and volunteers to make sure that those services continue during this time. 
I think you deserve a raise. I'm going to write in after the show <laughs> and tell you, whoever the administration is that decides on that, I'm going to say give Dania a raise. So I appreciate that. All right. You no, know, you're doing an awful lot, and I'm sure we don't even know a part of it, but what you must be going through, but to take care of all these groups. So on behalf of all of them, thanks so much. Corey? I have a really good staff, a really good core, amazing staff that when we had to sit down and brainstorm and how to get all this done, they had ideas and they were, you know, gung-ho where, you know, I had to ask actually tell them, okay, no, you cannot come into the office when we were trying to figure out how to, you know, decrease staff, but they have, have been on top of everything. Corey? Uh, so the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted uh, everyone in a huge way, and that continues to change uh, every single day. So just tell us a little bit uh, more about uh, how has the EAC network uh, changed since the start of the, of the pandemic? Um, and in what way is your agency like feeling the effects of the pandemic the most? Are you you're, are you in a lot of Zoom uh, calls lately? Every day, every day, all day. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Zoom webinar every day. Any platform that they have, I've I've been using it. Um, but yes, yeah, so we had to figure out how to make sure that not only our staff was safe, but that our clients were safe. And we're, we're essentially a social service agency that was told, you know, we can't be social now, right? <laughs> so um, we had to figure out how to make sure that the clients still were getting the services that they needed. And that, like I said, took a lot of, you know, brainstorming. And so for our outpatient clinic, we started doing telehealth services. And thankfully, you know, both um, the county and the state and the federal government changed a lot of the regulations that would allow us to do that to make sure that the clients still got the counseling that they needed, um, that they were still seen by our nurse practitioner and that, you know, our clinic director. Um, and so that was a huge shift because they're used to being in groups and, um, you know, being able to, to come into the office. But I think uh, we were able to make sure that we reached out to the clients, explained everything and, and, you know, put in place all the changes that needed to be put in place so that things were still done, but not necessarily face to face. Um, what I was mentioning about, you know, our senior centers and our Meals on Wheels, um, we went from having, you know, the seniors coming into the centers every day to, you know, figuring out how to make sure that they stayed engaged and how to make sure that that lunch and, and breakfast that they normally would get at the senior center, that they were still getting that. So that increased our meal delivery. Um, and so we had to make sure that we had drivers that can deliver the meals. We had to make arrangements with um, our vendors for the food to make sure that we had, you know, the increased amount of food um, that we needed. We had to essentially change where we were getting deliveries to, you know, streamline things so that we had people in, you know, not all over the place and that we could manage who was coming in and make sure that we track that because that was a whole thing with the, you know, the contact tracing in case anyone did test positive. We wanted to make sure that we knew who was where and when. Um, so it was a lot of, a lot of planning, a lot of, uh, you know how you see you saw Governor Cuomo kind of drawing things out and it was you know we were doing that as well trying to connect you know if this then that um, and every day was something different especially in the beginning when we were learning you know how close you could be and how many people in a space um, but you know, those were the, the, the big differences and I think a lot of the stuff that we've done We've done, you know, telephonically, we do the telehealth, you know, via any of the platforms. Some of our, our programs are using Zoom, some are using webinars, WebEx, um, some are using uh, Google. We um, had to have, you know, the phone lines in the offices transferred to, you know, staff phones so that they can uh, get in contact with clients. But it, it, it was a lot of, you know, just figuring out and every day, changing things and, you know, <laughs> making sure that we did have policies in place so that people could understand, you know, what was going on. And even here at the administrative office, we kind of made sure that the, it was staffed at the administrative office all the time because he, this is where everyone would call if they couldn't get one of the program staff or if they couldn't get anyone at the program would call the administrative office and then we would be able to guide them from there. So it, I think, you know, we, we were able to figure out things and that's still figuring them out as you know goes along but make sure make sure that you know the staff was safe but that the clients got the services that they needed you are listening to my hometown on the voice of nassau community college 90.3 whbc my name is Corey kaufman along with bill horan and today we're talking about eac network a nonprofit organization that empowers assists and cares 
for people in need across Long Island and New York City with our guest, Tania Peterson Chandler, their Vice President of Operations and Interim President and CEO. Tania, as I'm listening to you answer that question, I'm sitting here and then looking at our introduction. You're the Vice President of Operations, the Interim President and CEO. So to begin with, you have three positions. Now on top of that, you're doing all that you're doing in the middle of a pandemic where everything is changing every day. We're in a different phase every week. And even that changes. And of course, we have to be fluid because the virus isn't following any rules. It's doing what it wants. So I'm just sitting here amazed that you're so calm, cool, and collected. I I commend you for this because I I don't know how you're doing it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, you deserve it. And you're still awake. I'd be be asleep by now after doing all you're doing. But what are the day-to-day challenges? For us on radio, we're doing things by Zoom. And that's one relatively simple challenge, but it was not so simple for me the first time I tried it. I was getting all other things. I think I bought something from Amazon in between uh, trying to get my Zoom link worked out. What are the, some of the day-to-day things that you've had to change in the way you operate and the way the organization operates in light of the pandemic? So, I mean, I think the main thing was trying to figure out, you know, what staff needed to be in the office and what staff could be working remotely. And that was one of the the things that we did. I think it was, you know, like March 20th when they said we had to reduce, you know, people in the office. And it was really making a chart of here's this program, what does the ser- what are the services, what do we need to have done, you know, in the office, what can be done remotely. And that was, you know, the biggest thing. And then figuring out, you know, if staff had what they needed at home to actually perform the services and if they had to come in to do things like mailing and, you know, but I think we 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 were able to figure it out after the first couple of weeks and you had, you know, staff who felt that they were comfortable enough to, you know, come in. And so we had to, you know, kind of triage it as that, you know, like that as well. And staff with, you know, pre-existing conditions. And as we learned about the virus and figured out more, you know, things, figured out, you know, who was more susceptible. And um, you, you, I, I really had staff that were willing to do whatever was needed. Um, so then it was figuring out what was needed and <laughs> plugging in the people, you know, to the, to, into that. Um, and at the same time, trying to reassure the clients um, with all of the unknowns um, that, you know, trying to reassure them that we were still here for them and that, you know, whatever services we could provide, that we would continue to provide them. And then, uh, you know, the, the electronic piece of it was, you know, a hurdle for some staff as well. I do have a lot of staff that, um, had no issue with figuring out, you know, Zoom and WebEx and um, and and Google and all of it. But then I did have staff who were were you know nervous about it. They're used to their database, right? They're used to we've we've gotten away a lot from you know the the paper piece of things. But it's still what you know what they were trained on and you know using their computer. Now all of a sudden it has to move to using a laptop and you know figuring out a webcam. But I think you know, staff really helped each other so that, you know, they, they used each other's strengths and weaknesses in order to figure out how to get everything done. In your physical location, I'm just wondering, when I went into the post office, there's a giant shower curtain and we can see through each other. It's actually a very, I think, inexpensive way of, of doing things and to cut things off. But did you have to do things like that? Did you have to put up those plastic dividers, etc.? In some offices, we did. A lot of the offices, um, excuse me, we have reception areas where there were already dividers, but I, I can't say one, one innovative office <laughs> that we had was when in, in my Brooklyn location um, where they do a lot of case management with criminal justice clients, right? And they were one of the uh, labeled essential because there were clients that were still being released from jails and prisons. And so we could not be in the office for them when they were released. And so what they set up was in the waiting area, they had, you know, the a sign that had all the information. So they would come in, there was a, a phone there, it would say dial this number for whoever was on staff inside the location, they would ask them what they needed, they would come out. So we would provide them, we provide them with either their medication grant card so that they can get their medication and, you know, toiletries and things like that. So it was the least amount of contact, but also making sure that the client knew that someone was there for them. So essentially they would, you know, pick up the phone and say, I'm, you know, this is my name, this, I'm, I, you know, I had an appointment for whatever, I'm here to see whoever. And then they would come out with all the stuff that they needed. And we had, you know, the, the barriers and the gloves and the masks and, you know, everything. So it was, you know, kind of figuring, you know, that kind of stuff out. And then for offices that have, 
you know, kind of like the bullpen um, setup where everything is open, where, you know, we, we're not for profit, we try to maximize space, right? It goes now to changing that um, theory to figuring out how to make sure that everybody is safe in the space that we have. So yeah, we've used um, dividers and making sure that there are sanitation stations and soap and, um, you know, all of that available. <laughs> Many new expertises that you're learning, I guess, uh, on the go. <laughs> Yes, definitely. Corey? Uh, what is the biggest concern right now on Long Island and in New York that you're, um, that you're actively trying to uh, manage? I, I'd imagine uh, right now a lot of, uh, you know, obviously the biggest thing on people's minds is the coronavirus, uh, and, but I'd imagine that a lot of the uh, initiatives that your organization does, the problems have only been exacerbated. I also imagine that there's a lot of completely new challenges that you've had to face. So yes, so I'm, um, you know, like I was mentioning, where we have, you know, programs like the senior center where you have, you know, um, cleaners and, and cooks because that's what they do, you know, during the day. We were able to, you know, kind of maintain that staff, but shift what they were doing, and they became people who were delivering the meals as opposed to, you know, cooking the meals at the senior centers. So it's things like that where we had to kind of just figure out and 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 move along. But the, you know, a lot of the concern is making sure that we have the funds to continue to provide um, the services. So we um, are funded by, you know, our fundraising efforts, but also we have city, state, and federal um, contracts. And so as you can imagine, um, with all of the entities, there's been issues um, and, you know, delays in payments and delays in contracts. And, you know, they label us essential, but then, um, you know, give us an issue with, you know, changing, making budget modifications so that we can get PPE and things like that. Um, and, and, you know, so those are the things that I spend my time on um, so that the staff can figure out how to make sure that the clients are getting the services and that they are, um, you know, not upset about things or that they can try to manage everything else that's going on in the world. But yeah, our, our biggest concern is, is making sure that we have cash flow so that we can manage the services and, you know, keep everything operating. Danny, right now that was a great lead in and you didn't know my next question, but I was going to ask you, I, I see you've launched a donate for good fundraising effort or a campaign. Can you tell us about that and how maybe some of our listeners can get involved? Right. So, I mean, essentially what I was saying is making sure that we um, have enough funds to sustain the services that we're, we're um, providing. So, and, and so also do things like with our senior respite program where we help people who um, are providing uh, care for the family inside their homes and they need respite. Um, you know, we were doing friendly visits to them, social distancing, of course, but then also doing things like um, you know, having a banner on the, the van while we go by to say, you know, we're still here for you and um, things like uh, providing, doing birthday cakes and things like that, which, you know, in, in, in times like this means a lot to the population that we're dealing with. And so in order to do things like that is what we use uh, the fundraising money for, as well as to kind of fill gaps as we're going along um, and make sure, you know, a lot of it is going to making sure that we have the um, PPE that we need for, for staff and for clients to have available. So if a client does have to come in that, um, and, you know, they don't have a mask that we have the ability to give them that. Um, and then also to provide things to make it easier. So like we were talking about having to use Zoom, there's a cost to that when you have to do it, you know, uh, multiple people for a longer period of time on the zoom calls and you know so using it for that and not having to worry that it's not aligned within the budget or that i have to haggle with a a a, a funder to, to you know explain why it's something that we need or why i have to wait to purchase it when i know that it's something that we need right now is the reason why we have you know we do our fundraising efforts and that's what the uh the current um campaign is about and if someone wants to donate to that how do they go about that? How do they get in touch with you or do they just write a check? I'm sure you'd like that. <laughs> they can write a check. <laughs> so our website is www.eac-network.org. Um, and on the website, they can, of course, see our current campaign. 
Um, but then also we, uh, in the midst of everything, still need additional staff. So there are career opportunities and we need volunteers. Um, so there are volunteer opportunities that can be found on the website as well, as well as information about our individual programs. I think that would be a great learning experience, certainly for any students who are out there, younger people, or people who may be in between jobs. And also, you're really doing good for the people around you and in difficult times helping out. So uh, it, it just give us that again. Was it eacnetwork.org? Was that it? www.eac-network.org. I forgot the dash. See, that's why I'm not the president like you. <laughs> no, then I think that's a great effort that you're putting forth. And just to our listeners, that if they're interested, you just said you're looking for volunteers and employees so that if someone is interested, maybe it's a good time to get in touch with you and uh, see how they can help out. Absolutely. So I know every year we uh, here at Nassau Community College hold an event right here on campus where people like our own Rabbi Pearl, who hosts a show here on WHPC, gets to repel down the large tower building in the center of the campus. Uh, I'm guessing that's not going to happen this year, but do you think it's going to be back next year? Um, that was one of our more creative events that um, mm-hmm. everybody seems to love, so that may be something that we will try to bring back next year, yes. Yeah. And um, any other events that uh, we can look forward to in the future? Well, I mean, so right now we're trying to figure out how to do a lot of virtual things. So if anyone uh, actually wants to donate or give time, again, they can go to the website. But next year we're looking at bringing back our golf outing. We'll also have a children's event that um, is benefits our children's center that we have in um, Suffolk Court. So basically that's when um, people have to go to court, but they have their children. Instead of their children being in the courtroom with them, they can drop them off at our children's center. So each year, and um, usually it's in March, and hopefully we'll be able to do it in March next year, we have an event for that's dedicated for the children's center. Um, and we try to do events uh, that are, you know, for each division that we have, but the primary ones are, are the children's center event that we do We've, and, and things that we've done in the past, like repelling down the, the building. And um, our golf uh, event will be next year as well. Yeah, I, I'm listening to you answer these questions. And I'm just thinking Rabbi Pearl is a friend of mine. I want to sponsor him next year. I want to see him going down that building. He's not going to get me to go down the building, <laughs> but I'll certainly sponsor him and we'll have a little fun about it and uh, maybe go out for a cup of coffee afterward. Uh, it's been delightful talking to you. And by, by the way, is there any professional standards that you need for people? You need carpenters, uh, attorneys, teachers as volunteers. Whatever they can do, I can use it. I can figure <laughs> out a way to use it, man. That's absolutely true. I mean, whether they can be mentors, if it isn't something that, you know, I can directly use, they can definitely be mentors to either our youth and adolescent population. So, you know, whatever they have to offer, I can definitely figure out a way to use it. Now I know why you have three positions. You just said whatever they can do, I can use it. So this is how you get everybody involved, get everybody working and enjoy life uh, with the people you're working with. Tia, we want to thank you today for being with us and let our audience know our guest today has been Tania Peterson Chandler, the Vice President of Operations, the Interim President and CEO of EAC Network. Tania, please know that WHPC will continue to spread the word about your organization. And thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. I'd like our audience to know that I'm Bill Horan. I'm here with Corey Kaufman. Thanks for listening to this special edition of My Hometown. We like to get your feedback on My Hometown. Send your comments to whpc at ncc.edu. Nassau Community College, where success starts and continues. Till next time, this is Bill St. James. And remember, there's no town like your hometown. Hometown.